Senate Education, May 28th, and another remote hearing during the COVID emergency. And today we're going to bop around a little bit. We're in the phase where we've started to get bills from the House. Um, we have been asked to do a drive-by of a bill by health and welfare. And so we've got three different things we're juggling today, but I'd like to start with the lead bill. Um, everyone will remember we spent a good amount of time on that lead bill, which is now I believe Act 66. And uh, the um, Department of Health has been doing, I think a fantastic job fulfilling the mandate of that bill in terms of, I believe now all childcare centers are tested and we're at about 68% of schools. Um, so they were directly on target to meet the mandate of having everybody tested by the end of this year. Then the COVID emergency hit. So House and Senate have agreed to extend the deadline for the bill. Um, but first I was hoping that Mr. Englander could give us uh, a quick update uh, if those um, percentages are correct. Um, that would be great if you could confirm that. And then how are we doing in terms of uh, the number of sites in need of mitigation, costs of mitigation so far? Anything you can tell us along those lines? And then um, Jeannie, do we have uh, Michael Grady with us? He's, he's not available until three. Okay, so when he gets on at three, we'll have him walk us through the bill. Uh, but please, Mr. Englander, Tell us anything you'd like along those lines. Good, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be to be with you. Um, it, you know, despite the form, it's better to be, to be together. Um, I, I'm grateful for the characterization of the department's work. We've been very happy and proud um, of the work that's happened uh, thus far. I will say we were actually we were well ahead of schedule. Um, that the deadline was supposed to be uh, December 31st of this year. We actually had every school in Vermont. Um, scheduled to be tested at the end of the, but for six schools uh, with, with, which we've, with whom we've had some challenges um, uh, before the end of the school year. And then of course in mid-March this happened. So, uh, your, so your, uh, we have 40%, 47% of schools have been tested and the results have been provided on the public website, um, which of people I'm sure everybody has spent some time on the website, which was built by ANR which um, is extremely, I find it to be extremely easy to use, um, both in getting specific information as well as this nice overall summary page that's available that's updated. Um, well, it was being updated every few days. It is now being updated less frequently. Um, so we have 40% of all schools have been tested and the reports have been provided publicly and an additional 21% um, uh, of schools have actually um, collected samples and are sitting and are preserved in the public health lab. So we have approximately 4,600 water samples um, that are that have been preserved. Um, and, and because at that moment, we have to turn the public health lab uh, towards COVID testing. Um, although we do anticipate, I've had some discussions with our laboratorians, um, we do anticipate um, by by mid or late summer, being able to turn back to, to, to turn to take some of the resources from the public public health lab and uh, and start testing uh, the samples that we've collected. Um, we have uh, eighty six percent of child cares not located within schools have been tested, so we only have a, 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 a few uh, dozen left at seven hundred seventy one child cares, um, and uh, so we have approximately. Uh, so when I when I say I spoke to the, the folks who were doing this the other day, all of whom were deeply involved in in the emergency response, um, I asked how many um, child care programs located within schools had yet to be tested, and they said that would take a tremendous amount of digging because as a testing entity, um, they're being treated as one. So if you have a school, a elementary school with a child care located within it, we aren't making the distinction as a matter of testing between the two entities. It would be disaggregated when the when the data is reported. Um, the, uh, the amount of remediation, only a few dozen entities have actually sought remediation uh, monies um, on the order of just uh, a, a, approximately $30,100 have been uh, dispersed 
um, which we think is a little bit low. Uh, we were anticipating more uh, more entities coming forward and asking for remediation. That might be a function of of one of three things. Either they just they just hadn't taken the time yet, and then and then COVID hit. It could be that um, they decided to bear the cost themselves because uh, they were relatively minor. Um, but it, it also may be the case that there were many schools uh, or, or child cares that have chosen simply to, um, you know, to turn the taps off and or make them inaccessible. Um, if you, if I, I was going through, I believe it was Representative Webb a few weeks ago, just randomly picking on schools, and many of them, when they had a, when they had a tap that tested above um, the uh, the action limit, they simply took that out of service as opposed to taking the expense and time to replace it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it's fair to say that the money we appropriated was sufficient. Um, yes. And it looks as though it's on target to be underspent by a good amount. If, if things can go the way they're going today, yes. Okay, all, all to the good. Um, before we move to the House's bill, any questions for Mr. Englander on the existing program, the lead program? Okay. If I may, Mr. Chair, actually, yes. the uh, the rule on the uh, on the uh, that, that's required by Act 66 of 2019 um, needs to be um, in place by November of this year, but we plan on filing it. I hope uh, this week. Okay. We completed. We've had a public hearing. We've um, so we hope this. When I say file, I mean file with Elcar, and yeah. so or we'd be in front of Elcar hopefully within the coming weeks. Alcar did put a stop. Uh, they didn't put a stop. They um, they focused their energies on um, on rulemaking related to, to COVID, um, and they have now uh, they've now uh, widened that um, that opportunity for other uh, agencies. Okay, that sounds good. Um, all right. If we uh, are you familiar? I assume you are with the House's language. Yes. Okay. Committee, um, does everybody have the ability to pull that up at this point? It's on our website. Um, it is not a it is not a long bill. It's not a complex bill. It's the findings. I have been told findings were added, but it's really just a chronology of what's happened. So there there aren't really statements of fact as such. Just um, uh, what, bare bones. What, I'm sorry, what, group. What's the number? I don't. Is it? It's uh, nine fifty seven. Oh, okay. Um, so as you'll see, it's it's just a, a series of statements about this happened, then this happened, then this happened. Um, and then it's followed by the change in in the, the due date for the completion of the work. Any Anything you'd like to um, testify on as, as regards the bill itself? David. Uh, no, I think that... Um... I mean, I, I guess I would say what I said in the House, which is that um, there is significant uncertainty. Um, we, I can tell you this, that the, the moment that we are, we are able to get back to this work, we want to get back to this work. Yep. Um, my one question would be, I heard from Representative Webb that they, in putting the findings together, they found out that they had some inaccurate material in the findings. And I'm assuming that's been corrected that, Do you have that's, any... that's correct. So what, what the findings what, now is correct. What what was the the issue there? The issue was actually a miscommunication between myself and staff as to the number of of childcare that had been uh, had completed testing. Okay, um, because I think that's where I got the numbers I was using. Um, let's see. Well, maybe not, must have gotten it somewhere else. Uh, okay, any questions for Mr. Englander on this bill? Okay, does anybody see, I mean, we'll, we'll have a walkthrough from Eric, but it's, it's pretty straightforward. Does anybody see any issues that aren't necessarily clear in what's there? Okay. All right, well, thank you very much, Mr. Englander. I, I guess uh, 
Eric will be with us in about 15 minutes. So feel free to stay with us okay. uh, if you like. We'll pick it up then if you want to. I don't know if it's even possible to pop back in. Um, but we'll move to another bill now as long as we're. Uh, I, I will take myself off of audio and video, but I will keep an ear out. OK, sounds right. good. Thank you. OK, so this looks like a, a no brainer to me. I think the language looks fine. I do believe we need permission to vote it out. Um, so what what we can do is if we're satisfied today, I'll tell uh, Senator Rash that we need a meeting of the Rules Committee and indicate that we're behind the bill and we want to vote it out and get it over to the governor. So with that said, why don't we, um, since we have another witness on the school construction bill, I'd prefer not to make Mr. Gaughan wait through uh, another bill if he doesn't have to. So um, Michael Gaughan, why don't we move to the school construction bill, H-209. And uh, I know you were one of the witnesses that the House heard testimony from. If you could just introduce yourself and give your um, professional affiliation uh, we'd, we'd love to hear what you say about that particular bill. Sure. Well, thank you for having me here. Uh, like you say, I thought it'd be useful for you all to hear what uh, kind of an updated presentation I gave in the, in the House side when this was being considered. Michael Gaughan, I'm the executive director of the Vermont uh, Bond Bank. And um, uh, as you may or may not know, we uh, facilitate financing for... Um, the majority of Vermont's communities, both through our pooled loan program and through our uh, work in coordination with the Department of Environmental Conservation on the clean water and drinking water state revolving funds. So I did have some materials. Um, I don't know. Uh, we have them up. Okay, you have them up. So is it yeah. easier if I just reference the slide that I'm discussing? I, I think it's easier that way. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll move forward that way then. So uh, I guess as a precursor to starting this, um, you know, we're following as closely as we can the uh, uh, changes at the ground level as, as people consider capital project, uh, people being school districts consider capital projects. Um, you know, there was obviously a flurry of activity on this topic into late February. And then as we all know, the world went on hold. So um, after I saw that you all were sort of um, thinking through this issue, uh, I, I worked to try and update my numbers as best I could based uh, a lot of it are, are estimates and some um, kind of analyzing some work that the Vermont Superintendents Association has done. Uh, so the projections, you know, are, are projections, their best estimates. So I just say that as a um, as kind of a uh, asterisk to, to what I'll discuss. But um, the reason I thought it'd be helpful to speak with you all today is just to provide some context as to the school construction issue, because I think it it really helps as you um, sort of consider this new uh, uh, first step towards getting a handle on what our capital needs are. So um, on slide two here, the, the starting point for um, us, uh, the bond bank, and in a lot of ways, kind of the, the start of the issue that we face today um, corresponds with the bond bank. Uh, we were created in 1969, 1970, um, this followed a period of school construction spending around the state that we understand to be was primarily financed with short term borrowing. Um, at that point, uh, folks were looking for a way to provide a long term financing solution uh, for those those capital projects and then following our creation in 1971 we did our first bond issue um, and then used those proceeds to make loans to local school districts. And the first bond issue was entirely comprised of uh, school districts. Um, and the, I think the, the second and, and most of the third bond issue were, were comprised of school districts. So, um, you know, that was about 50 years ago. Uh, and so in a lot of cases, um, you know, the buildings have been discussed as being, you know, needing upgrades or, or, or have functional issues as a result of their age. And, you know, a lot of the buildings correspond with this time period in the, in the bond bank's history. Fast forward to today, uh, our portfolio consists of about 
um, uh, you know, 500 and it, it fluctuates depending on the time of year, but just say 550 million, 36% um, of that is currently comprised of school districts, uh, about 200 and, well, 211 million in uh, outstanding loans to school districts. So the next slide is going to walk through a progression here. So they all they all build on each other. But uh, slide three is um, historic activity related to the bond bank only in terms of uh, bond issuance or loans made to uh, local local school districts, and that's shown in gray on slide three. The blue is um, school construction aid uh, that was provided to us by the uh, uh, JLFO. And then the, the orange are um, authorized bond projects uh, that have not been issued. And, and we believe that to be comprehensive, but you know, I'm, I haven't done a, uh, a survey of everywhere, everyone, and um, this is based upon news reporting. So I believe it to capture everyone we know about. Uh, we're, we're in close contact with everybody, but I just say that as a caveat. So this an important distinction between this slide and the, and the subsequent slides is that this is in uh, nominal dollars, so dollars that have not been adjusted for inflation. And I think this is sort of the picture of the school, um, you know, the school facilities need that we under that we sort of perceive in that, uh, you know, the amount today is so much more in terms of is so much more than what we've seen over, say, the last 10 to, 10 to 20 years. And, um, and that's certainly true, uh, but I think what I wanted to do is just sort of put it in perspective by showing what this looks like on an inflation-adjusted basis, which is what's shown on slide four. And then it starts to tell a little bit of a different story um, in that the numbers today, although are, are very large, are um, are, are a little bit more consistent with uh, the historical experience. And in particular, going back to the start of the bond bank in 1970s, early 1970s, um, you know, uh, uh, find, I guess, historical reference in that time period. And now 50 years later, uh, you know, these facilities are sort of nearing the end of their useful lives. And that's why, uh, you know, folks that are that are in the facilities business, engineers, architects, facilities managers, et cetera, understand us to be in sort of a, a generational moment where um, we need to think through these issues. Um, and so obviously, you know, why the bond bank is interested, uh, we've got to manage our portfolio in terms of overall um, sort of allocation to our different borrower types, be they local governments, school districts, or special districts of, of one type or another, and then our overall exposure to um, any one particular issue uh, or borrower that, that we don't want to overwhelm the portfolio. And so um, that's why we have a real vested interest in, in understanding uh, the conversations around uh, what is the size of the need for, for um, construction funding and uh, and like the treasurer mentioned on Tuesday, really kind of disaggregate or um, sort of, um, uh, you know, separating this concept of funding versus financing. We're a financing agency, um, you know, we're not a funding agency. And so that, that has consequences as well. Um, so just building on this progression on slide uh, five is um, what you've seen already with the addition of uh, planned or proposed projects um, that 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 we that we know about, so you know the number may be bigger, it may be a little bit smaller, but at least back in the start of this year, this is sort of the universe that we got our hands around between our work, fielding inquiries about cost of financing, and the survey work of the Vermont Superintendents Association. So important caveat here, the dark green on the far right side of the graph uh, are two, includes two projects that were um, voted down uh, in early March. Um, but, you know, they, they will probably morph and change in some sort of way, but they're, but, you know, they're probably not going away, although the number um, may be smaller. So, um, so I think this, the barbells in this graph really show this sort of concept that we're at a generational moment 
as the, the life of those older um, facilities from the early 70s reaches an end point. Um, I haven't, you know, I haven't, uh, I wasn't around at the time. My understanding is that some of the high points in the mid nineties were related to some of the, um, uh, the, the technical uh, facilities. Um, uh, but, uh, but we have the data on that, but, but sort of, you know, that's, that's where I, I, I think we are. So, um, you know, just to kind of summarize here on an inflation adjusted basis, uh, our total historic issuance over the last 50 years at the bond bank um, has been 1.6 million. Um, you know, we understand there to be, oh, and that also includes authorized projects. So mostly the bond bank, but it also includes things like um, city of Burlington, uh, Winooski School District, and a few other um, uh, bond votes that were approved back in, back in March. And then you compare that to what we understand to be proposed or in planning processes and about 550 million. So, um, uh, you know, so, so very significant. So in terms of the bond bank, you know, that, that number could overwhelm our portfolio pretty quickly depending upon the timing. Um, so we, we really need help uh, in this process in a uh, kind of a prioritization process um, uh, a methodological way to understand what the future pipeline will look like. And then, um, you know, in coordination uh, with the General Assembly and others, um, you know, investigating possible ways that, that if needed, we, we might provide uh, financing. Um, and, and I would just add to this and, uh, and then I'll stop, stop talking. Last slide, you know, another reason why I think this matters at this point in time is um, obviously you have the budgetary considerations uh, due to COVID. And I think it's no, everyone's expectation that either at the voter level or at the education fund level, you know, there's gonna be pressures on education spending. So developing efficiencies through facilities is, is very important. Uh, and then, you know, slide six um, sort of speaks to some historical uh, example back in the uh, Great Recession, um, you know, school, school construction was an area of focus for ARA, the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. Uh, I understand that the, the HEROES Act that passed uh, the House doesn't necessarily in include, um, you know, school construction infrastructure is mostly finance or excuse me, focused on broadband. Um, but certainly you could see a scenario where there is some uh, federal stimulus surrounding social and physical infrastructure, in which case I think it would be important for us as a state to uh, be organized so that we can take advantage of, the, advantage of whatever program come down, comes down the line. And that's certainly what we did last time. Uh, there was a program called uh, Qualified School Construction Bonds that effectively was a 0% interest rate for um, schools that took advantage of the program and the bond bank helped facilitate that uh, in three separate issuances. Um, and if, but for sequestration, those borrowers have 0% uh, interest loans on their uh, um, facilities financing. So that's, that's just, that's everything that I wanted to share. I, I, um, uh, I think that accurately summarized everything, but I think the historical look at the issue is, is valuable as we um, gear up some resources towards thinking about the future, which we would highly encourage. You're muted, Senator. Not sure whether you've seen the House's bill. Um, I have. 209. Does it, does it uh, you know, dovetail with what you, you say your institution needs? Yeah, I, we're not... You know, we're not in the weeds on the facilities planning and the actual um, engineering construction side, but mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, generally um, getting assistance, having, getting everyone's heads around this issue. Uh, is it a billion dollars of work? Is it two billion or is it 500 million? I think that is just a really critical question and uh, will inform our efforts to assist in the process going forward. So that's, um, you know, that's the largest consideration from our perspective, just what is the, what is the, the number overall? Yeah. Uh, questions for Mr. Gone. 
Uh, first, Senator Hardy, then Senator Perchley. Thank you. Um, Michael, thank you for your testimony. This is helpful background <clears throat> information. I'm wondering, you mentioned in this last slide, you have a slide comparing the current situation to the era funds that came out after the Great Recession. And while we have no idea if school construction will ever be on the table from the feds, um, the bill 209, I believe, has a planning process that drags out for like three and a half years. Is that right? Some some long period of time. So uh, that would probably be longer than is necessary to have sort of shovel ready information if we're, you know, next year might get lucky and have federal funding. So do you see any way to speed up that sort of planning process at this point? You know, I can't speak, I know I've been sort of involved in the conversations with the architects and I think there's a few different methodologies about how you evaluate facilities, but that's obviously not my area of expertise. Um, what is my area of expertise is sort of the timeline, you know, identify the project, uh, pass, a, pass a bond vote if that is in fact the way and, and, um, and then, you know, pass, pass that bond vote at a number that is realistic based upon um, some architecture and engineering work. And, and that stuff takes time. Um, so, uh, so I think getting started as soon as possible is, is probably the right, uh, the right idea. And but, just what, one follow up, I, I mean, assuming that all of this need that we, that is out there is actually, I don't know how to say it, legitimate need. Um, I think I heard you say that it, the need would overwhelm your capacity to issue bonds. So it sounds like you need to do it over a more gradual basis. Is that correct? Did I understand that correct? Uh, in the current framework is, I guess, the way I characterize that. So, um, you know, we, like any lender, there's only so much we can give to any one entity based upon the size of the portfolio. Diversity is really important. So we have a, we have a structure that we use now that's been developed over the last 50 years that is very, that is, that work, that functionally works because of the set of assumptions we were dealing with. If there's, you know, X amount of dollars that are, that of need that need to be financed now, that sort of makes that uh, framework um, somewhat, not obsolete, but just not useful for this particular issue. So I think this funding versus financing question is essential because I think this is really, really a funding problem in a lot of ways. And once we understand that, we can say, yes, we can be helpful working with the treasurer, obviously, or um, under the existing framework, or we need to develop, you know, a new mousetrap to sort of solve the financing problem. But prioritization of what the projects are, what is the funding source, um, what's the level of, um, of approval process that, that occurs from DOE or others, those would all be questions we'd want to have answered prior to developing any new mousetrap or evaluating whether our existing um, uh, program uh, is appropriate. Thank you. Senator Perchley. Yes, thank you. So uh, I guess my basic question is of the bond issuances, how much has the municipal bond bank done? Are you doing 90%? of what's happening, like on these graphs, this graphs is total bond issuance is not just the bond bank, right? Uh, this is, well, on the, hist so the gray, the gray bars on the graphs, those are the bond bank. I think we, it's impossible for us to know what our overall sort of uh, amount of projects financed is um, short of looking through you know, asking every single school district what they finance and who they did it with, but we assume our it to be very high. I'd say upwards of ninety percent um, in aggregate. So I think you're getting a very fair look at uh, at the activity historically. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, so one question I have is, I I hear you expressing support for the house's language. Is there anything? that we might or, or should add to what the house has in terms of you, your needs, the ultimate needs around the bond issues? 
Not from my perspective at this time. I, I really, more than anything else, just wanted to encourage the, um, you know, the passage of, of something that gets at the, the need and the, and the planning. Mm -hmm. um, that, those, that, would, that would really be the takeaway message from our perspective. Okay, great. Well, I appreciate that very much. The historical information is always really useful. Um, I look at it and it, it says to me that as you put it, we're in, a, we're in a pivot period again where we have to replace our buildings and it's gonna happen without state guidance of any sort if we don't do something. So I, I appreciate that. So if there's no further questions from the committee, uh, Feel free to stay with us if you like, Mr. Gon. Otherwise, feel free to drop out, but we'll shift back now to our lead delay bill uh, because I believe we have Mike O'Grady. Uh, Mike, are you with us and non-video participant? Yeah, there we go. I'm here, I'm on video. Okay. Welcome. So this is going to be the easiest work you'll do all day, I think. But I, I want to be able to say that we uh, we will walk through the House's lead delay bill. So okay. uh, if if you want to just take us through that and anything that's not uh, visible to the to the naked eye that we might miss or any issues that came up around the drafting of scheduling or anything like that. Sure. Do you want me to share my screen or? Uh, no, we, we've all got it up, I think. Oh, okay. All right. So generally, as you know, last year, Act 66 uh, required schools and child care facilities to sample uh, drinking water outlets to determine uh, the lead levels in the drinking water. The testing uh, was required to be, is required to be completed by December of 31st of 2020, but the Act 66 also required that the sampling occur while students were in the building so that real time um, actual lead levels would be tested um, when students were present. Because schools are closed under the governor's order um, and summer is soon upon us and there's uncertainty as to when uh, students will be back in classrooms. Uh, the department has asked for an extension of one year to complete sampling in schools and child care facilities. Uh, the one issue that came up was whether or not one year is too long, whether or not the department could complete it by the December 31st, 2020 deadline or not. Um, the department, when they asked for the extension, said that they will, in all good faith, try to complete the sampling and testing as soon as possible. Uh, but they believe because of the uncertainty and because of the shift of their staff that have been working on the program to COVID-19 issues, that uh, it would be practical to give them an additional year in order to complete um, the full testing. So most of the bill is a finding section that relates to what I just told you. So uh, Act 66 requires the Department of Health to administer a program to test drinking water in school buildings and child care facilities for lead contamination. Act 66 requires testing uh, um, to be completed on or before December 31st, 2020. As of March of 2020, sampling for lead in the drinking water of 80 Six percent of all standalone child care facilities complete, and sixty-eight percent of all schools have completed sampling. Act sixty-six requires samples for school buildings to occur during the school year in order to test the composition of drinking water when students are present. On March fifteenth, Governor Scott issued the directive dismissing all public and independent schools. On March seventeenth, Governor Scott issued the directive closing all state-regulated child care facilities except for those for essential persons. On March 26, 2020, Governor Scott issued Directive 5, directing all public and independent schools to remain dismissed for in-person instruction for the remainder of the school year. And because of the dismissal, and because of the closure of child care facilities, and because of the uncertainty when students will return to instruction within school buildings, 
Um, it is likely that testing of drinking water in all school buildings and child care facilities will not be completed on or before December 31st, 2020. Department of Health staff assigned to administer the requirements for testing of drinking water for lead in school buildings have been assigned to COVID-19 response, testing and health surveillance. And then last, in order to allow schools sufficient time to test, test drinking water for lead when students are present, to allow child uh, facilities to complete testing of drinking water for lead and to allow Department of Health staff to return to administration of school drinking water testing program, the General Assembly should delay until December 31st, 2021, the deadline for testing in school buildings and child care facilities. And then you'll see section two, the deadline was uh, extended from December 31st, 2020 to December 31st, 2021. The act would take effect on passage. So that is a ready-made floor report um, for whoever, whoever uh, reports this. Um, I, I, I have no questions. It looks very straightforward to me. Any questions for uh, Mike by anyone on the committee? Okay, Mike, I said that would be your easiest job all day. Uh, I, I think that's all we need. Um, okay. And Mr. Englander, anything you want to add? I'm here for questions if you'd like. I don't think we have any. Uh, so committee, is it, uh, am, am I reading you correctly that this would be a unanimous vote? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, so I will contact the rules committee, tell them that we'd like to vote it out on Tuesday and that'll, um, put it on the calendar for Wednesday, maybe, or Wednesday or Thursday. So we can pass it back to the house next week. Um, which is great. So thank you, Mike. Thank you, David Engler. Welcome. What's that? Would it go back to them or we're just going to- Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, we haven't made any changes, so we can go right on to yeah. the governor. Okay, so let's then flip to our third bill of the day. And Debbie, um, I'm not sure, do we have a copy of that bill somewhere? Uh, I think we just need to search for it on the, you know, web system. Uh, it's okay. 663. 663? Right. Um, I'm just... H or S? H. Six, okay. six. An act relating to expanding access to contraceptives. So Debbie, do you wanna just um, tell everybody the auspices under which we're asked to look at this? Sure, yeah. So uh, this is a, a bill that was uh, done by the House Human Services Committee and it's come to um, Senate Health and Welfare. Um, it it uh, pertains to um, expanding access to uh, condoms uh, specifically um, and uh, there are four sections of it that uh, touch on um, either distribution in schools or something something to do with uh, with schools. Um, so um, Senator Lyons asked me to kind of bring this to the education committee's attention, and then you know, of course, if you want more information, Katie McLenn is the ledge council attorney who drafted it. Um, I can just highlight the, um, the sections that pertain there. As I said, there are four. So the first, the first one is uh, section three of the bill, which is on page um, six. Oh, I I'm looking at the unofficial house version. Oh, I was looking as passed by house. Shouldn't we look at the one that the house passed? Yeah, I thought that was, I thought that's the one I had. Yes, yeah, passed by the house. Uh, I have unofficial. Yeah, the unofficial one just has doesn't have the um the red strikeout. It's easier to read yeah. the unofficial one. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay. So section three. Section three. Yeah. So this is um this 
changes the definition in all of Title 16 VSA, um, whereas before um, it had been it, the, the definition of comprehensive um, health education. Um, previously, th this definition had only pertained to a subchapter of um, 16 VSA, and, which is the education um, you know, title. Um, so really that it simply just uh, applies this same definition to the whole, whole title. It's very, and the, nef, nothing else about the definition has, has changed. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Right, and Okay, then moving on to section four, which is uh, on page seven. Um, so this is, um, this is um, the part where um, it uh, requires schools, um, secondary schools, which in our definition uh, in Vermont is grade seven through 12 to, um, to supply, sh shall make condoms available to all its students free of charge. And it's very similar to what we worked on with uh, feminine hygiene products in that it leaves it up to the school's discretion as to how to how to provide them. Um, so it's administrators working with uh, school nursing staff sh shall determine the best manner in which to make the condoms available. And at a minimum, we place in locations that are safely and read readily accessible to students, including the school nurse's office. Okay, so somebody could at a minimum only have them in the nurse's office. Yes, that's right. okay. Um, so the question is really, uh, do we want to make, well, do we want to just indicate that we don't want to work on this? It's fine with us. Do we want to indicate that we do want to work on it if we see some need for alteration? Um, Right. I mean, that's what Senator Lyons said. If you, you know, if yeah. the, I mean, there are two more sections. I, I still need to go through uh, just, okay. briefly. but this is the meat of it. But, but that, yeah, that's the question. Do we want to actually look at it formally and, uh, or do we want to just say, let you go ahead and do what you want in health and welfare? I think. Well, let's look at the other two sections and then we'll. Yeah. Okay. We'll... Yep. So the next one is section six, which starts on page eight. And so what this, this is about um, the mandated reporters who uh, mm. report about child abuse and neglect. And so uh, what this does is create an, an exemption from, um, uh, it, you know, if, if a, there, there's no requirement, if a student takes a condom, there's no, there's no assumption that there's in, that that is pertains to, um, the mandated requirements. Uh, okay. So, you know, so all these people can just let them do it and there's no... In other words, knowledge that they're potentially sexually active is not... Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And then section 10 is the last one. And that is on page 12. And this asks for a... Uh, for... Um, Let's see. Uh, this is asked for a report uh, on or before January 15th, 2021. Um, it's a joint report by the Agency of Education and the Department of Health to um, House Human Services and Education and Senate Health and Welfare and Education regarding their continued efforts to support schools and school districts in providing comprehensive health education, which must include sexual health and safety. Okay, so any any questions from anybody on any of that for Debbie, having uh, Debbie been in on the discussions in health and welfare? Yeah, Ruth. Can we just go back to the section about the mandatory reporting? I just want to make sure I was clear that it just means that seeing a student take a condom from the nurse's office is not a cause for reporting child abuse or anything like that, that it's okay to see a kid take a condom and you don't need to report it to anybody. That's correct. correct? Okay. I just want to make sure. Right. 
All right. Anybody else? Yeah, Jim and then Andy. <clears throat> yeah, I'm not good with wasting uh, taxpayers' money to buy uh, uh, condoms for uh, our youth, um, whether they're reporting or not reporting. Uh, I just think that's a waste of uh, hard-earned money, and our money could be spent uh, in other places, such as maybe uh, school lunches or, or uh, breakfast for kids that are, that are hungry more than um, the need to buy contraceptives for uh, our school children. Okay, definitely finance is always an issue. Debbie, was there a fiscal note on this piece? <clears throat> there is not yet. So I, I, when there is one, I can let you know if, if we don't have to take it. Okay. So that, that might be a reason for us to work on it, or it might be a reason for um, Jim to vote against it on the floor. Andy? Uh, on the reporting, I thought it was the way I read it. It's more than just you saw someone take a contraceptive, like you're providing it to them. You know, they could have asked you for one and you give them to them. It's not just you happen to see, see them grab it. Well, that's a good point. Yeah, it does say to provide, you know. Um. So I would think that would be the nurse, um, unless Make well, let's say, it's available. Yeah. Uh. yeah, let's say you had a, I mean, I can see other issues that might arise, but let's say you had a 10th grade teacher that decided to have a bowl of condoms in the classroom um, and was not part of this plan. They wouldn't run afoul of the mandated reporter thing, but they might run afoul of other, um, you know, codes or procedures within the individual school district. Um, yeah, that was part of our concern in health and welfare. We started talking about we wanted to hear from some school districts that, you know, we figured certainly that there will be some that will be more comfortable with this than others. Um, well, that's why I asked whether or not having the nurse supply them exclusively could pass muster because I think most districts in Vermont would would probably be okay with uh, a small dish of them in the in the nurse's office as opposed to wider distribution. Not saying all because I think Jim's point, uh, you know, would not be uncommon uh, that it, that it was an expense that we, that we the taxpayers shouldn't be taking on. Mm -hmm. um, so now that we know the scope of it and the, and the basic range, um, how many feel that we should uh, exert some sort of influence over the bill as it moves uh, versus just letting it go under health and welfare and then either voting for or against it on the floor? So let me go to the first question first, just show of hands, how many think we should take it in and do some kind of work on it, even if we didn't do it formally. Okay, nobody. So everybody else, uh, just show of hands, believes that we should just leave it to health and welfare. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so uh, Debbie, if you wanna tell Ginny that we um, took a look at it, I'll, I'll just say my own opinion is that it looks fine to me the only question I have, and I hope you'll take this um, back to Jenny just as a thought experiment, and I'll put it out to the committee for the same thought experiment. I have been thinking the last few days about our feminine hygiene products legislation. This could very easily be amended on the floor, um, although there might be a call about germaneness, but since this deals with distribution of products in schools, it seems as though we might be able to survive a challenge on germaneness too. Um, that would involve a discussion probably with Senator Ash, the rules committee, but um, that would help us move a piece of what we had in the miscellaneous bill. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, we'd, I think we want to speak to the House Human Services um, because this does, I mean, the other sections of, of this bill actually pertain to ways to make contraceptives more accessible in other settings. It's not just, about, you know, schools. No, understood. Uh, but, yeah. but if we're looking for a vehicle to 
to move things along. At, at least the only estimate I've heard about when we'll actually break uh, this time is June 19th, which gives us three more weeks, which is not a lot of time. So if, if there is a, a fit, and I wouldn't want to do it over the objections of health and welfare. So um, Debbie, maybe you could do counter liaison work and show them our feminine hygiene products. Sure. Well, and since I think Senator Lyon sponsored that anyway, didn't she? Yeah. Anyway. So, so just sound her out on that. Uh, Ruth, you, you had a question. I just wanted, it, isn't it something that health and welfare could just put in the bill if they liked it and it wouldn't even have to be a floor amendment? Yes, uh, which I think would be great. I just didn't want to presume that they would. Um, Got it. So any, would anybody have big objections if we um, brought out the Feminine Hygiene Project uh, products language? Okay. In our miscellaneous bill, right? I mean, that's where we put it. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, which, which is in a holding which pattern itself. I'd like yeah. maybe next week to pull that language out again given where we are now and just take another quick look at it. Is there anything else we want to um, go forward with? Do you remember yeah, what the bill, bill number is? Sorry. I do not know, Debbie. Okay. Ruth? Yeah, I just want to note, I think in that bill also, there is actually a section that's pertaining to the comprehensive health education language. Yeah. It doesn't change that language, but it also makes a little tweaks. So if we were to pull that bill out, Debbie, you might want to look at that section too and see if it's relevant or contradicts or whatever. Yeah. Uh, yep. Okay. So um, we don't have Becky Wasserman and the school construction bill is still in ways and means. I did speak with Representative Webb about it. I told her that we've had very supportive testimony from uh, the secretary, from the treasurer, now from the bond bank, um, as well as the architects that were advising them. So I have to say my own opinion of the bill has improved a great deal. I, I think now that the house's focus is probably a good one, which is on procuring a apples to apples um, data bank of the schools around the state getting a handle on the overall need. None of those experts seem to balk at the price tag as we had, but I still think our number one concern was timing, um, that it was, gonna, it was gonna hold things out for a three to five year interval. Um, so what I'd like to do is um, on Tuesday, take that up again have Becky Wasserman in with us and see if there isn't a way that we could get something moving. The, the agency does have a program now. They just, you know, you can now submit requests to the agency for assistance. It's just that they don't tend to green light any of them. So maybe there's a way to use their existing bank of requests to see if we can't get something moving. Maybe the most high priority of the projects they already have. I don't know, just spitballing, but there should be a way to get something underway prior to the development of this list. Um, but I think that's all we'll need to do today. So unless anybody has further business, I said, uh, uh, Ruth then Debbie, and then Andy. Thanks. I just wanted to let you guys know about a conversation we're having in Senate Ag um, that we discussed this morning about food security issues. Um, and we're thinking about this as part of our larger Ag relief bill. Um, and uh, it involves some school food issues um, uh, as well as other things. Um, and Debbie, uh, Chris Pearson was gonna reach out to Ginny about this as well, um, because it would also involve like Meals on Wheels for senior citizens and the Vermont Food Bank request for funding. Um, but specific to this committee is, um, we're trying to figure out a way to get some more money out the door for summer meals for the, um, so that schools can continue to provide um, broader summer lunch um, and meals for kids. Um, 
And um, so we're working on language. Michael O'Grady is actually drafting it. And I would want to just bring it to this committee to have us take a look at it and make sure everybody feels comfortable with it. And we were hoping to get sort of buy-in, the Ag Committee was hoping to get buy-in from the Education Committee, the Health and Welfare mm -hmm. Committee, and the Economic Development Committee on a sort of food security package that we hope would qualify for the CRF funding. Um, but just wanted to let you know that there's a piece about school meals and school food service workers. We, we are focusing on the summer right now because that's the biggest issue. Most of the school food service contracts end on June 15th when most schools close. So wanting to get something so that places that do want to do summer programs and, and can do it can have the resources. So just an update and hopefully next week I'll have more information. So Ruth, whenever that language is ready for us to look at, just schedule it with Jeannie. Okay. For the next the next hearing. Okay. And we'll because it doesn't sound like it'll take a long a long time, so we'll fit it in whenever the language is ready. Yeah, I'm I'm assuming everybody will be good with it, but just want to yeah. make sure that everyone yeah. had a chance to weigh in. Yep. Debbie, you had something? I did, yeah. Um back to the school construction uh bill. Um, did we talk about where the one and a half million would come from? Is that from the Ed Fund or from the capital? Would that come out of the capital bill? Or I, uh, yeah, I, I have a feeling yeah. that uh, the Ed Fund, I, I know that's what the house is working on. Um, I think that makes okay. sense myself. Yeah. And there's no way it would qualify for any federal <laughs> money. Is there, <laughs> I, I always, I always like to go to that pot first. Yeah. I, I, I still think that the, uh, you know, the air exchange systems, the HVAC systems, and all of that, all of that expense, including planning around changing that or, or any potential, um, you know, consultations that we have, it seems like all of that should be able to be covered. But I think here we're talking more about deferred maintenance that's, you know, 10, 20 years of historical duration so it's hard to make the case that covid but you know i'm i'm up for it if, if they can make it work in jfl <laughs> um so andy you also had something right yeah on that bill i was going to try to work on some language on the ventilation stuff i've had further conversations with some folks norm and others about things that we th thought could be cares eligible that could happen quickly they would be small things mm -hmm. you know not not getting to the deferred maintenance and replacing whole systems that would take um, too much time but there could be a, some a small grant program that just like reimburses costs for for updating their filters and you know very simple things like that could be you know five to twenty thousand dollar grants or something like that so i was hoping to do that and wondering, you know, if the committee thought that was worth the effort. It seemed like that bill would be the vehicle for it, unless there's also some CARES vehicle that I think, operations would do. I think it would be great. And I think it's a very handy um, assignment um, because your, your expertise, um, it seems to me, lies around that sort of thing. I, I guess there's a part of me that feels like it shouldn't be that hard to, for AOE to put out uh, an urgent email to all school districts and say, if you believe that you have uh, an HVAC system that needs complete replacement, that is, has already you know, been proven to be in need of replacement, why we can't get those names to AOE and then have Norm or somebody else go out, do an inspection, and then have AOE green light that work and tell them it has to be done by December 31st. Like, I am I know that ordinarily there would be all kinds of barriers and deadlines and, um, you know, delays, but in this case, air circulation systems don't even seem to me to be ambiguous. That should be completely covered. Um, and so, missing the chance to do full replacements is just seems to me like 
it's it's one thing if there's nobody that can demonstrate within the amount of time that they need it. But it seems like, you know, I, I would bet my money on Norm to be able to go into the school. In fact, if you gave him a list of 10, he could probably do it in a week and come back and say, eight of these need full replacement. And then, you know, as we've done with PPEs and ventilators and other things, like make it happen. Um, yeah, and there are some schools that have already gone through the process of getting bids. They just don't have any money, you know, so they they already know kind of what it would cost. So, so that's the challenge is like, how do we how do we do it so that it can be happen quickly and get through all the normal bureaucratic red tape? And what are the boundaries so we can come up with a dollar number kind of thing? Yeah, Ruth. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, in large part, I agree. I think that some things we do need to consider, though, are one, I think Norm said in his testimony that a lot of times these systems are tied into other systems in the school, and that when you're ripping out the ventilation system, you might also be dealing with a lighting system, or you might find asbestos, or you might have I don't know, drywall issues. They're, they're all just like other issues that, you know, once you start a construction project, it balloons. Um, so yeah. I think we just need to keep that in mind. And then the second issue um, is that because we have so many school buildings that are in really, really bad shape, if we go in and put in a shiny new ventilation system, but the plate, but it needs a roof and there's, uh, you know, mold in the basement or whatever, whether or not we are putting a band-aid on something that either should have a full fix or should maybe not be a school building anymore. Um, you know, so wanting to just be careful that we're investing the, the money in buildings that we want around for the long term versus those that should be taken out of commission. No, good, good points. I, I guess what I would say is if we don't do it by December 31st, we, we won't be wasting, well, then we will be wasting the government, you know, the federal government's money, um, and we will be on the hook ourselves on down the road. Um, but Andy, maybe as you um, are working on that language, you could think, you know, are there, are, can we determine quickly whether there are schools where it would be both necessary and possible to replace the systems altogether? The, the really expensive jobs that we, you know, even if we could get one or two of them done, that might be millions of dollars that would otherwise, you know, potentially get shipped back to Washington if we can't find a COVID related use for it. Um, but I would be delighted to have you work on that, Andy. Okay. Um, try to report back by Tuesday. And then one other thing on that bill, there's a, the first part of the bill is then creating standards because to, for the consultant to go out and do the analysis of what buildings need what work they'll need to have a benchmark you know that's like these are the standards we're judging it by mm -hmm. and that's that's a difficult task and it seemed the, that aoe was saying that they might need staff to get to that first part so just as if we take up the bill that's another issue that i think needs to be discussed a little bit more okay well thanks everybody um, I think that gives us uh, three or four different things to work on next week. Um, so we have our two highest priority bills, which were the, the adjustments to the healthcare bargaining and the reorganization of the state board are both over in the house. Um, the healthcare bargaining bill is in house general um, with Tom Stevens and obviously the state board reorg will go to house ed. And so I'm not, I'm not sure at this point what will happen with either bill, but um, I think it's great that we were finally able to move those. As I say, I, I would like to take a look at the miscellaneous bill next week. If there's anything that anybody is interested in doing now that we're back more or less to a business, uh, uh, not business as usual, but a, a, a standard business, frame alongside the emergency frame. Let me know because as I say, we only have a couple more weeks before we'll take a break. When we come back in August, I believe the intention is to have mostly the, the budget driving the discussion at that point. 
not that we wouldn't be able to move something, but time will be short, I think. So with that said, thanks everybody. I'll see you tomorrow in the Senate floor. And, uh, and if I don't talk to you then, have a great weekend. Likewise, thanks.